so the idea with this panel was during the day if there were questions that uh, you know were not answered or if you wanted to ask something we got all the speakers back i think we're still trying to get bruce uh, he's not yet responding but uh, we'll get started anyways uh, the rest of the speakers are here so this is more of just an open panel for uh, you know you guys to ask questions that uh, could not get answered during the day or anything else that came up so it's kind of open if nobody asks then you can ask each other questions and <laughs> so does anyone have a question yes please Uh, hi. So uh, my question is around uh, cryptography and Erlang slash Elixir. So where I come from is, if you look at a lot of hashing or encryption algorithms, a lot of them involve, uh, you know, like uh, breaking up a file or a binary into multiple portions and then probably mixing them up, juggling them up, playing around with the bits. Uh, and if you look at Erlang or Elixir, uh, one of the features that, uh, you know, one of the powerful features is binary uh, pattern matching. So, uh, do you think Erlang slash Elixir would, uh, it'll, it'll definitely be a good way to express an encryption algorithm, but when it comes to performance, what are your views on it? That's my question. That's a great question. I know, okay. Um, um, I think that perform doing all, like cryptographic stuff in Elixir is a terrible idea, and because it's low, uh, and usually it's a lot of CPU. Uh, to do these kind of things, but um, most stuff uh, that most crypto stuff in Erlang is implemented through NIFs, right? So that's a very good combination to you have. You can implement stuff yourself. You can bind through like the OpenSSL um, library, or um, there's a bunch of Rust implementations that you can use as NIFs. So um, it's a good idea if you can use NIFs. Then it's uh, like to get the per raw performance for the cryptographic requirements, uh, like CPU requirements for cryptographic stuff, uh, that mixed with the uh, Elixir's and Erlang's ability to very nicely deal with binaries in general, like and files for sure um, as binaries, um, it's a very good combination. So yeah, I think it's good idea in general. I, I don't disagree with you at all, but I. Um, I'm unable to recollect what, but I feel like I've seen uh, one implementation of, I think, some hashing algorithm or something that was pure Erlang for some reason. And th that was my first reaction to why is this in Erlang? But um, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm imagining this, but I feel like I've seen that somewhere. And with a good, I mean, it did address this particular question why is this in? Um, Does that answer your question? So uh, Eternity blockchain also uses one, uh, I think, B Blake uh, two for uh, their uh, their blockchain needs. Uh, so that's a pure Erlang implementation that I could find, and that's when I got this question as to whether. I've read in a lot of places you said is, is that Erlang slash Elixir will be very slow for uh, cryptographic uh, algorithms, but uh, this was one question that I had in my mind. Yeah, Th this was what uh, rather uh, made me think. Yeah, I'm not sure about the specific performance characteristics of even that implementation, um, but I, yeah, I do think that a lot of languages can uh, borrow this feature, definitely. Right. Any other questions now? Moving to the next one. Also, there is a some sort of a documentation about binaries pattern matching in the Erlang documentation. So it goes more in detail about performance characteristics of using binary pattern matching. So, uh, yeah. So you should look into that. Right, I'll ask a question <laughs> if someone else is not asking. So if you, uh, if you had a magic wand and if you could fix one thing in, uh, on the beam or in, in any of the languages that work on the beam, what would it be? 
I'd like to hear each of the panelists' view on this. If you had a magic wand and you could fix whatever you wanted, what is the one thing that you would fix in the beam? For me, is right now only problem I have with uh, not beam especially, but the not having access to Erlang documentation right into Elixir. Uh, Rappel, so that's a problem, but but Elixir has a first class document uh, documentation as a first class, so that's not the problem. But only right now, if we're able to fix that, having all the work of Erlang right into our ID and having access to that, so we have type signature and all, but not able to access that. So I think if that would be fixed, so it would be perfect, in my opinion. All right, cool. Oh, I am in a state where I feel that Erlang is at the best because I have been working in Erlang for like only two years now. So I don't see any problem as such. So I may be not be able to answer your question. All right. Um, I think there should be some things uh, left. Anything that is perfect would uh, be really difficult to grasp. So. Uh, Things that are not there should not be there. Maybe we can try to uh, get closer to the idealism, but idealism could not be achieved. So, I think you're giving very philosophical answers. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, like, uh, so you're saying basically Erlang and uh, Elixir and the Beam is perfect, and whatever is there is perfect. Is perfect. Nothing <laughs> needs to be added. Nothing is perfect, but uh, you know, as you work on it, uh, the gap that remains towards the perfection, uh, it actually inspires us to uh, learn more and uh, reach towards perfection. Okay. I think um, uh, one of our biggest problems has been with um, the ecosystem, uh, especially across different uh, Phoenix versions and different Ecto versions, Ecto is the ORM. Um, it was, we had some issues around migration not being as straightforward or our dependencies working with specific versions but not working with other versions, which was unfortunate. I, th I think that was the most painful thing for us during our work. I'm really glad that nobody said types. That the magic thing that I want to add is types. I'm really happy about that. Uh, but for me is, um, Erlang syntax, get rid of the commas and the dot and the periods and the colons and semicolons and sometimes nothing. That's, um, I think, confusing for beginners. And um, I would like to get rid of a lot of stuff, legacy stuff that is in Erlang and like make Erlang a better foundation for even what Elixir does. Um, so it's moving in the right direction, but there's a lot of stuff that is in Erlang that has like inconsistent APIs or uh, modules that are there for legacy that can't be removed. But I would wish that the, there was more so, uh, like isolation of this component so that you don't need to bring them. Uh, and m one thing that I en encourage everyone to look at that I would really like to get rid of is the three different APIs in the queue module in Erlang. If you have ever worked with this, it's amazing. There's a, an API that's just when you have to get an element from the left of the queue, it's spelled like cons, maybe, for example, or something. And when you get, get it on the other side, it's just spelled backwards. It's knock, yeah. Yes, number one feature request, please. Let's get rid of that. <laughs> I think um, with, uh, with the existing state of types and gradual typing, or whatever it is that you do get to a dialyzer, it has been extremely slow. Um, we did spend some time looking at like typing everything, but uh, um, I mean the benefits are obvious and all, but um, it it was painfully slow. And yeah, I think that could definitely that if that was not that slow, we would have definitely used it. Uh, what do you mean by, like, what was slow? I did not understand. The type checking. 
the amount of time it took to check. So the type checking is at uh, like a runtime type checking. No, it, it was a separate step for us. I am not sure if there's anything else in the ecosystem right now. Uh, there's um, there's something else other than dialyzer. I forget what it's called. It's some other riser. Uh, it's not. So, so you're saying that dialyzer was was too slow. It, it was uh, at least in our situation very slow. It it wasn't something that you could run at every save of a file, for example, which is what. I am Karthik. Uh, when we talk about robust machines, it generates huge amount of data, obviously. So we need to deal about that uh, huge amount of data. Anyway, we have to store that. Uh, huge amount of data persistently in any database, and we have to handle it efficiently. Is there any way Erlang could help in this, doing this? How oh, exactly a huge data can be efficiently handled, like performance or something like that? Can, uh, does anyone want to take that? Yeah, can you be a bit more specific? Uh, yeah. Like if we if say, for example, if we're taking red bus as we saw in the morning, uh, she was saying like they are, they are using the Erlang term for using uh, search criteria. So wherein a large amount of data will be there in a database. We have to fetch and it must be uh, faster. We must get the response faster. Uh, is there any way Erlang helps in doing that? Uh, is there any uh, any role for Erlang to play in this, or it's only database? No, uh, the thing is, you can use uh, multiple process to fetch concurrently. So that is how you can achieve the speed in this case. That's what I can think of. Okay, how oh, exactly can you give me? Like for 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 a one one single search request, you can spawn multiple uh, concurrent process to fetch the data con uh, concurrently in a faster way okay. that's what you're trying to ask uh, even if you concurrently pass the base this the thing is a database anyway it's going to hit there in the database yes. uh, is there anything like if you can match uh, map and reduce or something like that which we can improve performance or something like that? Erlang, i mean i am not aware of any library which provides this okay but, uh, Erlang as a raw uh, it doesn't have anything of map and reduce so. I think um, uh, what's always tempting with uh, Beam and with Erlang or Elixir for me is that it feels like a lot of problems you don't have to reach out of the system, uh, whether that is to the database or to a cache or whatever. Um, it, it's one of those workshops where you're in the workshop and you know that to build the thing you want to build, you can just be here and build everything. You don't need to step out. And uh, that does, I mean, if you look at the classic example, the reason uh, chat servers are so trivial to implement is because um, the language and OTP um, allows you to think like that very easily. Like going from step one where you're like, I know how to write functions, I know how to spawn processes. The next thing you do is, oh, I can now build a cache in my in my service, not outside. Or I can build an index for this thing and treat that as a separate process and do something. Uh, I think the fact that the language enables that thinking helps. And uh, that's definitely a thing that people use in practice also, I think. A at least we have. Thank you. OK, thanks. It's a follow-up to Naresh's question. I know some of you, like Sujata, has prior experience with Java. So if you had a magic wand and you took, you could take one thing from Elixir or Lang to your past life as a Java programmer or as a closureist? I've also written uh, a, a year of Java, maybe. Oh, so you're one of us. OK, so <laughs> what is it that, what's that one thing that you'd love to take back to your past life that would have made your life much more easier? That would be the supervision tree, self self healing capability of Erlang. That would be one thing I would like to take into Java world. Yeah, for me, it's a supervisor. Yes, it was selling point for me. It was one o'clock in the morning. I was reading Francesco book, and I just had an aha moment, and I knew it. I had to learn going deep in this language. So yeah, supervisor. 
every other language should have all. Yeah, it has to be supervisories. Yeah, um, I mean, I am actually not able to answer that question in a straightforward fashion because it feels like the 10 different things or the three different things or whatever the number of things that you get with Erlang are all very intertwined with each other. So, I mean, to, if you're saying supervision trees, you also are saying I want processes in the first place. You want lightweight processes with immutable data, with inboxes on those processes. And these processes are isolated from, like you're asking for a lot when you just say supervision trees. Yeah, yeah. it's very, I, I'm not able to answer that question, you know, like this is the most first thing I would want. So basically you're t saying that if you took supervision trees, you bring that, would, that would be a bad idea. No, you just bring <laughs> because, all, you just bring. You, you will not get everything else in other languages. Yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> then that would be a bad idea. To yeah, that would be a bit difficult. Yeah, that's a bit difficult to imagine even. Uh, but if you're doing that the right way, you're, what you're saying when you say I want supervision trees is I want all of Erlang in Java. Um, it depends on the language where I'm bringing this stuff to, but the uh, number one for me is immutability. Um, so you just make it easier to work. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, the process model that Erlang has is amazing, I think, and that's, uh, you can't really take, like, it's, we were discussing, you can't really take away, like immutability, message passing, and isolation are, and mailboxes are, and like, yeah, they are tied to each other in a way that you can take one of them, it doesn't make sense. So, but that's what I would, like the main feature that I would want in every other language. Supervision, you can implement yourself, you know, on top of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you have the um, like the actor, the process model that Herlang has with links and monitors and message passing, it's I think that's a killer feature. Um, one of the things which is like quite inspired by Erlang in Java world is Akka. Uh, which is again pretty similar. It has lightweight process and uh, message passing and immutable messages and such. And it's used in a lot of uh, big s uh, systems. Like these days, people are building huge distributed systems based on Akka. And Akka itself has like distributed storage and etc. built on it. So how how would you like how do you compare like Erlang and Elixir with the JVM equivalents and I mean, wh why <laughs> why are people using Akka at all instead of Erlang? Does Akka do per process garbage collection? Uh, no, I don't think it does that. It's on JVM, so I don't think it does yeah. that. That's an advantage of the Beam, but I've never used the Akka. Yeah, I don't have, I haven't used or looked into even Akka, so. Since it's a JVM, I believe it's a shared heap memory. So being a shared heap, mutability, I believe, I'm not sure of the language, but if there is a shared heap and mutability to the language, then concurrency is hard in itself because you have to take care of the safer concurrency so that multiple threads do not uh, modify the data. So I believe it's a little complex even though they have simplified from Java. I'm not sure how the uh, language actually works. But if you need concurrency, Erlang should be the right choice to start with because of its advantage with immutable and being process-wise and uh, heap is within the process, garbage collection happens per process. So I think that's the advantage we have in Erlang. Any other questions here? Hello, I'm Krishna. I'm actively developing in working in Erlang for the past five years. Uh, the, I am facing a problem in Erlang regarding uh, code version maintenance. Uh, as you are aware, uh, Erlang will have an application architecture and each application will have a major version, minor version and a build version. And you can also have version numbers for individual modules. So if I make a product release, 
initially i will make the module versions and application version similar but then even then after if i make a single change that involves a single module i have to obviously change the application version but should i change the remaining module versions also so i just want to know how you guys maintain the module versions and application versions or you update the version every time you make even a single change or how do you do that how do you do versioning basically module versioning Erlang, as such, how you follow uh, versioning for any particular application holds good for Erlang also. Uh, no, Erlang has a lot of beam files. Each application will have a package of beam files. Each beam file will have its own version. Some beam files will be specific to, to, to that application. Version each file. Yeah. I am not understanding. Why do you have to version each file? Not each file. I think he's talking about each, each module. module. Okay. That's very similar to any other language, right? Like if you take Java, for example, you would have jars and each jars will be versioned. And then you have a package which basically yeah, that, will... Yeah, that jar will be a collection of class files. Correct. But each class file will not have any version. Uh, so, so when he says each module, it's actually effectively each file because a mod you have one module in every file. Right. Um, I haven't done this in... Uh, Erlang and um, in Elixir, you're not really versioning your modules by default uh, or something. Uh, I'm not sure if the question is about uh, writing applications or writing libraries. Like, if you're writing an application in Erlang, if you pin a version of Erlang or OTP, you have a fixed set of versions of each module, right? An application in OTP. If you say 22.1.0, yeah. that's just a fixed version that's not going to change, right? Yeah. So in application code, we just pin a specific OTP version and we pin a specific Elixir version. And then for dependencies, we have requirements, right? So we say, for example, 3.0 and onwards, but not 4.0, you know, like tilde greater than. Um, if you're writing a library, so that's does it answer your question if you're writing application code? So what I understand is we don't care about the application wise modules, uh, versions. I've is never looked way? at application, uh, the version of an Erlang application, no, never in my career. Like I, I, I look at the OTP version and that entails some application version, but I don't really care what the application version is. Also OTP doesn't follow semantic versioning, so it's very fluff, fluffy, you know, what, what it means for version change, like OTP uh, can do breaking changes or like they don't follow semantic versioning, sadly, so. Okay, thanks. One more. Uh, sorry for asking too many questions. If somebody else wants, please. Uh, Mic from me. Um, my question was: uh, So, what kind of applications? Uh, since you, you all of you have, um, you know, worked in Erlang and Elixir, what kind of applications do you build in it? Like, you know, when I say kind, I mean like, is it like a chat server sort of thing, a game? Is it like a CRUD system? Is it uh, analytics uh, system? Is it like I don't know? What kind of uh, systems are have you generally built in Erlang and Elixir? Just to give us an idea of what it is good for. I mean, for example, you'd probably not build a compiler in a lang, so that kind of thing. Um, for me, I'm um, a bunch of web apps, like w APIs, for example. Uh, I've built with Elixir and um, a lot of um, asynchronous systems for either processing events uh, or, yeah mostly processing events. Like, uh, for example, you want to send a bunch of push notifications, you, gen you, you uh, like, an event happens, you process these events, and this event leads to going to a database, fetching a bunch of rows, sending push notifications, talking to, like, external services to send push notifications, like, an asynchronous system for processing, general processing of events. And that's um, what I'm building now as well at work, is just a asynchronous 
messaging system where we just process, basically services are there to process events, process and generate different events. Uh, I think in general, Elixir and Erlang excel at um, IO bound applications because they're very good at managing uh, IO and they're very good at like talking to other systems. So um, whenever you have to integrate a bunch of systems, there are they are a good choice, I think. And for web, they're a pretty good choice as well for the reliability and isolation properties and the like for process garbage collection and this kind of stuff. This is and I've built a bunch of libraries. That's the stuff that I built with Elixir. Yeah, I think uh, I've most of my career I've worked on things that are behind websites or uh, mobile applications, whatever is running on the server. And I think nearly everything I've done I could uh, guilt-free pick uh, Elixir or Erlang for it. Um, except maybe that one time um, I had to build some sort of uh, search index effectively, which is, yeah, CPU bound. So it's not it's not something I'm immediately reaching for, and I might look at doing something else there, but I think everything else, um, if it makes sense for your team and whatever, I think that's any, any back-end server-side. At Redbus, actually, we have used Erlang for uh, back-end servers for both booking and search engine. Basically, a REST layer for serving the search results as well as booking a bus ticket. That's one use case we are using it for today. Uh, for me, is two. One is like a fault-tolerant GUI application. There is this library. I just forgot the name. So each of the GUI elements are like uh, individual isolated process. What was the name? So uh, uh, CNIC, yeah. Uh, so you can imagine, and the NERV project, so you can imagine having a IoT applications and you have some GUI and each of those individual elements, the GUI elements are independent. So there is, you can, they can crash independently and I have, so I, I'm really excited about, I think in the future, these two projects is going to have a much uh, bigger impact on uh, Beam community because if you just want to build an API, you can do in any, tool you already are familiar with. You don't need another tool technology, but I think IoT is the space where Beam is going to shine in maybe, I don't know how many years. Um, I am uh, currently working on uh, a cloud side uh, command center for uh, IoT enabled uh, Wi-Fi routers. So, uh, the routers uh, are also uh, embedded with uh, uh, Elixir code. Uh, cloud is completely Elixir over here. And we have a mobile app. So we have a REST layer that communicates with the cloud. And uh, so whenever uh, uh, there are some events, so s for example, we have, uh, we are uh, developing for a smoke detector system uh, that is, uh, connected to your uh, Wi-Fi system, and this system then sends a notification to the admin or the owner of the house if uh, they detect a smoke. So uh, we are uh, really uh, creating something uh, for a, a soft uh, real-time system. A good example can be this one. And uh, we, like, suppose uh, some new person connects to my Wi-Fi, I would get a new notification uh, immediately. Uh, I would be able to keep a track of uh, the signal strengths uh, that uh, end uh, users, uh, end devices are getting. I am able to uh, check the uh, network speed on my router. So uh, these many tasks uh, can be performed uh, uh, mainly because uh, the the Wi-Fi router and the cloud, there is a consistent uh, socket open over there, and we have uh, a heartbeat signal that goes uh, approximately every 15 seconds uh, to the cloud, and uh, that gives uh, a pretty much a fair idea of, of what is going on. 
so you can uh, gauge the amount of uh, work that can be done in elixir so just to summarize is it fair to say you know your typical event driven applications probably would be a good starting point to look at this uh, you know iot will kind of fit into event driven uh, quite a few web applications would kind of fit into that domain as well is all event kind of something triggering uh, so in some sense like you know event driven in general across different verticals would that be a fair summarization yeah uh, because uh, the basic of uh, a beam is uh, it mostly acts on message passing and here uh, we uh, we can generate a message whenever uh, an event is triggered so uh, we can easily uh, apply uh, uh, erlang or beam uh, ecosystem on an event driven application I mean, their GUIs are again some somebody's clicking something, so it's an event. So uh, you mentioned IoT. Um, is there is that the same regular distribution of Erlang or Elixir, or is there like an embedded version of Erlang that gets deployed on resource-constrained devices? And if so, is there like any constraints on how you communicate with them? uh i am not sure about uh, the uh, firmware side implementation if it is uh, if uh, like if they are using nerves or is it uh, plain elixir but uh, we are uh, directly communicating with the end devices using rpcs so uh, that pretty much uh, makes uh, sure that uh, we have a elixir system or an erlang system that is running over there in the end devices Yeah, I don't think we're quite equipped to answer that. Uh, hi. Uh, in one of the closure talk, uh, uh, I heard like uh, wh when uh, a list or something like big object, it, it, if it is passed to one function to other, so it uses a uh, special technique or like persistent data structure. So when uh, like if it is thousand uh, elements list and one or two element is modified in the other function so it will instead of copying the entire list into uh, instead of copying entire list it uh, intelligently uh, maintains the linked list so I, I couldn't find much information in like how it is done implemented in Erlang or Elixir so uh, any idea about like how it is managed uh, I'll, I haven't actually looked into that uh, but I've taken that for granted with any language that has immutable data structures that the implementation is roughly some version of the same thing. Uh, maybe someone who has looked into that can speak about it in detail. Yeah, I, I think um, the, uh, um, the purely functional data structures book, I think all these languages that have implemented um, purely functional data structures have derived um, the only information I could find is like when it is message passing to other process, like if it is more than 64 bytes, it will maintain the memory in the heap, like in general memory. But I, I couldn't find uh, within the process like how uh, data structure is maintained. Yeah. Um, I, I, I can't answer this question for you specifically about uh, Elixir or Erlang. But um, uh, if you want to, uh, learn about how the data structures are implemented in general and the thinking behind um, um, complexity of these data structures and whatever not. I'd recommend uh, this book. Um, it's called Purely Functional Data Structures, Chris Okasaki. Okay. Yeah. Bruce can answer all questions. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if I may, the question was uh, um, immutable data structures in uh, Lang and Elixir. Uh, in Clojure, we know that um, there's chunking and uh, I the way immutable data structures uh, are, built, uh, are implemented, they're optimized to um, take advantage of the persistence and stuff. 
in that if you add an element to a list, the copy of the list is sharing the rest of the list with the previous list. Uh, we couldn't find, or none of us have looked at the implementation in Erlang. Is that similar? Uh, what is it like? So I don't know about taking advantage of the persistence, but um, but a, a list in in Elixir is essentially it's it's made of of conch elements. Is that the same way as closure? So it's basically connected elements. So um, that means that um, when you're copying any kind of list or, or um, a structure that uses a list, um, if if you copy from the head forward, it's much more efficient. And if you copy with from, from the tail, then you're basically replacing everything all the way up to the tail. Is it the same enclosure? I think so. I think that's the same. Yeah, and, and I, I don't know that level of detail. So not all questions, Nourish. <laughs> Thank you. Hi there. Um, dabbler in functional programming. Um, I come from a Ruby background mostly. And uh, for me, choosing between Elixir and Erlang would be very simple. I would choose uh, Elixir. For the people that choose Erlang, uh, why? The people who don't like Ruby. I think that's my answer. <laughs> Um, I agree that uh, on the question, like why? But uh, I think that mostly, uh, if you're writing applications right now, um, unless you like, unless you're very particular about some things like tooling, for example, Erlang has some better tooling on some particular things. Like um, some people find the common test. What's it called? Uh, some testing framework that Erlang has find it better and it's hard to use from Elixir. So yeah, unless you're very particular about that, I think that uh, if you're writing applications, right now Elixir is probably the better choice just because it's um, it's a superset of Erlang, right? Um, it has arguably like a better developer experience than Erlang um, and um, um, like it's easier to consult documentation, for example, right? Like you're consulting from the shell or whatever. So if you're writing an application, I think, uh, and it provides a bunch of features that are just on top of Erlang, uh, like protocols, for example, right? There, you get that that for free if you want to use it. You cannot use it, um, but if you're writing an application, you don't really care about, like, you're you're the end user, right, of the language. So I think that Elixir makes m more sense most of the time. Uh, if you're writing a library, it's different because Right now, it's really painful to use a library written in Elixir in an Erlang application. So if you want to write a library that's targeting the whole Beam community, it's much easier to write it in Erlang uh, and consume it from both Elixir and, and Erlang rather than writing it in... Uh, um, and it's not always possible. Like I personally struggle with this because I would like to write Erlang libraries, but I also like some things like structs too much to give up, give up and not use, right? Um, and uh, same goes for um, in some cases where you have macros. And if you write a library that uses runtime macros, wait, runtime macros meaning that you use macros in your code that you use at runtime, then you can't use them in, um, like you can't call the macros from Erlang, right? Little extra macros from Erlang. So if you need those kinds of things, you have to end up running your library in, in Elixir, but I think Erlang like the most important library in the ecosystem should probably be written. If they don't need Elixir features, I would think they should be written in Erlang. Um, and a good example of this was recently was Telemetry, which is a metrics library uh, that was written in Elixir, and then the authors realized doesn't like why close it to Elixir, right? Like everybody can use this, so they rewrote in Erlang and the ports. Are, like if you're not using macros or protocols or structs or Elixir features, the is pretty straightforward usually. So 
And um, yeah, that hopefully answers. Thank you. Um, I haven't picked Erlang, and I wouldn't uh, right now uh, for most of the cases that I encounter. But at the same time, um, the Elixir does, b because it's more m modern in terms of what the language looks like, it's more approachable. Uh, but once you've done, um, say, Elixir for some time, looking at Erlang code, it actually feels a lot more succinct. Like it's, it feels like it's lesser code doing more work. And it maps, it, it feels like some of the Rubyisms that are in Elixir are n noise almost. Uh, and not allowing you to directly talk about, like I am sending a message, that is it. Um, I'm unable to give you a good example right now, but I have had this sense. I think Francisco, uh, maybe a year ago, tweeted about this specific aspect, trying to compare that it's actually much more succinct to directly express in Erlang. And I think he should have been here, probably he would have taken the other camp. But. Well, I think that sometimes um, the choice of a language is, is an emotional thing. I mean, if you look at just strictly the expressiveness of the language, Elixir is a more modern language with more modern constructs with almost everything that, that um, Erlang has. Um, it has, especially the macros, that's, that's a game changer when you can write code in code because Elixir is basically expressed in itself and, and Erlang can't be. Um, when, when, you, when you're thinking about um, you know, some of the macro types extensions, you're doing that with essentially playing bytecode games in Erlang. But um, so part of the reason that we use languages is um, how they make us feel, right? And, um, you know, Joe Armstrong was a, was a great friend of mine. And, um, you know, I, I didn't have the same experience with Prologue that he did. And so, um, you know, I can remember um, being in a room um, at a conference like this one with probably about the same number of people and um, sitting down at lunch and um, he must have had bionic ears or something because I, I mentioned something about Erlang syntax and Joe stood up and yells across the room at lunch, you know, with conversation way over there, what do you mean Erlang has a beautiful syntax, right? <laughs> and, um, and I was just incredulous, but... Um, <laughs> But there were so many people in, in the room that, that agreed and loved him. So, I mean, much like a, a comfort food, um, languages can, can be that way for, for many people. Um, so, yeah, and I, I now think Erlang is, is beautifully expressive for many problems. Uh, for me, uh, although I'd love to write Elixir, but I find Erlang code easier to understand because it doesn't have those modern constructs. It's very clear, but writing is difficult, but reading is, is like reading a book, maybe, because it's very to the point. You're just reading line by line. Nothing is going, even because you, 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 can't, you can't rebind the, the, the variable itself, it, the name itself. You can't rebind that, so it's make it more clear. But writing is hard. Thank you. That was really interesting. All right. I know Robert Werding doesn't use either. He prefers to use LFE. He's a lisper at heart, so he likes none of the above. <laughs> All right. I think we've just overshot the time, unless someone has another question, or we can start wrapping it up. Keith? Yeah, one more. Uh, what is the state of Phoenix in the world of web development these days? How does it compare in its maturity and tooling with uh, Rails and Django, and and um, and to to what extent has it taken off, if at all? Okay, so um, in, in terms of in terms of the tooling, it's they're really different animals. Um, but in in terms of um, of productivity, well. I think that one of the things that's happening is something is becoming important that has not been important um, before in the history of Rails, and that is um, is really raw scale and raw horsepower. And that's because what we're trying to do is um, render a model. For those for those of you who saw my demo on um, on Live View encoding the game of life, 
um, there's, a, there's a new programming model where, where you're trying to update a model on the server side and based on that build a web page and change only the values that have changed down to the client side. Um, and to do that, you have to have a very consistent transaction, um, a, a transaction length, right? Um, a very consistent latency um, on the user. And if you if you really um, if you vary widely at all, which languages like Ruby um, and and Python do, then you don't get that unified, um, the super crisp user experience. And so I think that that's about to become really really important, and maybe the primary driver um, in, in, web, um, in, in web development. So um, my guess is that Phoenix is about to be um, really, really important, even more so than it is right now. Thank you. Um, I, d I don't think at this, uh, at this point, um, I would even compare Phoenix to Rails. They are slightly different beasts. Um, um, in my experience, Phoenix has been more like Sinatra or whatever the current version, the current Sinatra is, which is a thing that allows you to um, build your API and do that. It has had some features like Live View, which are uh, you know maybe a bit. Uh, more complexity over just giving you a language to build an API. Uh, but um, there's definitely, if, if you're building web applications, there's definitely some uh, lack of maturity in certain things. Like if um, you're talking about device, for example, to do authentication, um, you wouldn't find something, say, as comprehensive or it's less likely that you'll find something as comprehensive in the Elixir ecosystem. Um, uh, but that said, the uh, like Bruce was saying, the foundations for modern challenges, which is performance and stuff, um, uh, are quite solid. And I think, uh, for me at least, it's more pleasant to be working on that foundation than being happy about device having some specific feature that I need right now. Right, thanks a lot. Uh, appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. And that's it. That's a wrap. <laughs>